My name is Brooke Hathaway and I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Human trafficking is a crime. Um, there's different definitions based on different government entities, um, but for the United States as a whole, uh, the crime is one where if you are uh, compelled through force, fraud, or coercion to engage in forced labor um, or commercial sex, um, and automatically, if you're under the age of 18 in commercial sex, you're considered a victim of human trafficking. Um, but it's really that, that forced uh, or that compelled piece uh, through force, fraud, or coercion. So it's the compelling of somebody to do something. It happens all over. So it happens um, where most people expect it. Lots of times people are thinking Southeast Asia, Thailand, etc. And it certainly happens there in huge numbers. Happens in Eastern Europe. That's another uh, common uh, uh, idea from a lot of different peoples that it's in Eastern Europe and it certainly happens there. But it also happens in North America and South America and Central America. It happens right here in Cincinnati. Um, so it's happening in every community worldwide and that's because it's so diverse. Um, and so when you're talking about human trafficking, you're talking about um, somebody that's compelled to do something and that could be in the form of forced labor. Uh, so think somebody that's forced to work on a Thai fishing boat, right? Um, but you're also talking about bonded labor, somebody that has um, a bond over their head uh, or owes a debt, and that's actually the most common form and very prevalent in Southeast Asia. Um, but you're also talking domestic servitude, so we see that here in the States a lot. Um, you have lots of different workers, um, often documented workers coming to the United States and forced um, to do things like cleaning or watching children, etc. So that's domestic servitude. Um, then you have child labor, so of course any of those types of categories we just discussed, but for that special circumstance of children. Um, and then you also have sex trafficking, and so that's commercial sexual exploitation of individuals. And again, by federal law in the United States, any uh, person in commercial sex, doing a commercial sex act um, under the age of 18 is automatically considered a victim under the law. Now they're not often treated like that, right? When you think of lots of prostituted women uh, and men, um, if they're under the age of 18, they should be considered a victim. Again, not treated that way. Um, but that's why I can say that it happens in every community because the type of work is very diverse. It can range from uh, forced prostitution of somebody to forced work in a brick kiln or uh, on a fishing you know, in fishing or any type of industries. Um, so that's how you see it everywhere. So the greatest risk, I actually wouldn't put like a, a demographic qualifier on that. It's, it's, it's taking advantage of somebody who's vulnerable. So vulnerability is the key to being um, at the greatest risk. So think about somebody uh, that's vulnerable because they don't have a job and they don't have employment um, and a means to provide for their family. Extremely at risk because a trafficker can absolutely um, exploit that situation and compel them to do something uh, that at first could be, they could be in agreement with, but then quickly transitions into against their will. Or somebody um, like here in the tri-state area, think about a homeless runaway. Way. They don't have a home, they don't have food, they don't have access to the resources that they need, um, and therefore somebody comes along and can exploit that. Um, so it's not necessarily the color of your skin or your age or where you're from, your nationality. Instead, it's all about those vulnerabilities. Um, and so people that have vulnerabilities, which is all of us, um, can be targeted uh, by traffickers who will then take advantage of that to create an instance of human trafficking and to create a lot of profit. Um, so worldwide, the Freedom Center uh, supports the research of the International Labor Organization, which is a UN-affiliated organization. And there's lots of different data about the numbers of people involved in human trafficking. But we support the ILO, uh, and they say that there's 20.9 million people enslaved worldwide. Um, and there's nuances between slavery, forced labor, human trafficking, etc. but lots of people use them interchangeably. So for the purpose of this, I'm using them interchangeably. But most people of those 20.9 million probably think that that's in sex trafficking. That's because local news reports sex trafficking, we watch documentaries, we read CNN, right? And that's kind of the sexy piece to learn about. Um, and in fact, of that 20.9 million, uh, we believe that 4.5 million are exploited in sex trafficking. Now that's a huge, significant number and absolutely deserves attention. Um, but when you think about that, that's one quarter of the entire world's victims. So the vast majority are actually exploited for labor. Um, and again, they're not always concrete different categories. So you will often have um, somebody that might be exploited for sex but is still forced to do physical work or vice versa, somebody who primarily um, is, is making bricks or working in manufacturing or uh, in agriculture. We just had a huge case in Ohio uh, where people were found guilty of working on an egg farm. Um, but you still might have instances 
cases of sexual exploitation. Um, but that is definitely the number one myth, is that sex trafficking is human trafficking. Um, and I just wish that more people understood um, that it also involves labor, uh, and lots of people fall, fall victim to it as it relates to labor trafficking. So identifying human trafficking is really hard, um, and because of that, the signs are really difficult. So again, if you think back to the definition of human trafficking, it's about compelling somebody to do something. You cannot take a picture or a snapshot of somebody being compelled to do something. You have to get to know their story. So for example, if I see a crime of drug trafficking or of human smuggling, I can take a picture of that because it's the act of like somebody being smuggled across a border or somebody conducting a drug trade or somebody, I mean, any other crime is very similar to that. Human trafficking is so unique because you have to know the narrative behind it. Um, and so there's not instantaneous signs where you see somebody and can say, that's human trafficking. Instead, it's picking up on clues and pieces like that. Uh, so uh, getting to know people, understanding their story. Uh, do they have papers? Do they have access to leave their workplace? Um, are they able to move freely? Do they seem like they're under the influence or abuse of another person? Things like that are all key to understanding this. Um, but again, it's not any one telltale sign. It's getting to know an individual, which again is hard because a lot of these people um, are moving very frequently and across board. And not, Human trafficking doesn't require movement across borders, but they're just very transient groups, right? And so you have people moving from one bar or one farm into this one. And so as us, as observers, it's hard to identify which signs might stick out, um, but it's putting together a lot of different puzzle pieces. It's very easy to believe that slavery doesn't exist anymore. Um, and if it does, I'm not directly enslaving somebody, right? Um, and that's not true. The, the shirt that I'm wearing, um, the food that I'm consuming, all of that is likely made by slaves. And so um, that's the number one piece of education. Again, when you think of human trafficking, you often think of sex trafficking. Uh, I don't buy commercial sex, so it's very easy for me to say I'm not a problem of that, right? Um, but I do buy coffee, I do buy chocolate, I do buy cotton t-shirts, I do buy bricks, I do buy slate. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and I think the key uh, piece to educating others is how we're directly responsible for that. So we've got to become educated consumers. We've got to learn um, how what we're buying is made by slaves. Then we can't become depressed um, and, and not able to do anything about it. There's plenty of alternatives, um, but it takes attention and it takes intentionality, um, and we've got to do that. The Freedom Center has amazing programs for human trafficking. So first and foremost, we have a great permanent exhibition called Invisible Slavery Today. Uh, it's a permanent exhibition here. It's been open since 2010. It's a great exhibition to walk through in about 30 minutes, get a grasp uh, on what human trafficking, forced labor, et cetera, looks like in the world today. So start with that. Two, right now at the moment, we have a great traveling exhibition called Enslaved, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, these beautiful photographs that this woman traveled throughout the world um, and took pictures of people as they were enslaved. And so just imagine the access that she got um, and the humanity that comes through in those pictures and the sadness, and but also inspiration that they're still persevering. Um, so they're just really incredible, so I highly recommend that. Um, that's if you want an experience where you come to a museum and you're learning, right, in a traditional sense. Then the Freedom Center operates a program called End Slavery Now, uh, which is really phenomenal. We know that uh, if we're going to eradicate slavery, not just legally abolish it. So we legally abolished it in 1865, as we all know, with the 13th Amendment, the end of the Civil War. Uh, the last country to legally abolish it wasn't until 1981, which is wild. Uh, that was Mauritania. Um, so it's legally abolished everywhere, but it exists, right? It still persists. You still have the practice of slavery, of human trafficking as we know it persisting. Um, and so end slavery now, we understand that if we're going to end slavery now for real, uh, we've got to get the consumers, we've got to get the general public involved. So if you were to look around at my colleagues and the people that are generally really involved in the anti-human trafficking movement, they're law enforcement and really great police officers, they're uh, lawyers that are expunging records, they're um, social workers, they're medical doctors, things like that, what I would term practitioners, meaning they're professionally involved in this, right? And you've got that everywhere from people doing those services here in Cincinnati for victims, all the way to Nepal, to India, to Thailand, et cetera, right? And you've got this great band of people that are doing that. I believe, however, that we've got to move beyond practitioners and you need the public to get involved so we stop buying the things that are made with slave labor. So we've stopped buying commercial sex, um, but even more broadly, buying other goods that are made by slave labor. Um, so End Slavery Now seeks to educate normal, everyday people like you and I. I'm not a police officer, I'm not a lawyer. Um, the number one question I get when somebody learns about human trafficking is, oh my gosh, 
what can I do? Um, and I want there to be answers out there because if I'm saying that we all have a role to play in ending this, um, then I've got to give you answers on what you can do. And so that's what we do at End Slavery now, um, is curate and collect um, and and pull out all of these different resources and ideas and ways you can get involved. And we collect those from partners on the ground. So we work with folks like International Justice Mission or Free the Slaves or Polaris Project. And also organizations that are working in remote countries. Um, the people that I would say have boots on the ground. Um, we work with them and we say, what do you need? If I could deliver you a thousand bodies that were willing to take an action, what would impact slavery in Bangkok? What would impact slavery on the streets of Cincinnati? What would impact slavery wherever? They inform us, uh, and then what we do is set out in, in getting those mass numbers by the general public, and that has two main purposes. One, you're impacting hotspots around the world, but two, you're growing a movement so that you and I are getting involved in this and finding ways that we actually can say yes and can do something, uh, and then you're encouraged to do it again and again. If you study social movements, uh, which I have, you know that you've got to have a critical uh, change in the public's attitude to create a mass movement, um, and we're right in that tipping point, and so that's what we're trying to do is is collect all of those different ways and make sure that you're equipped uh, so you know what you can do. So if you want more information on that, it's endslaverynow.org. Again, it's a project run by the Freedom Center. It has amazing assets on it. So for example, there's uh, an anti-slavery directory. Um, so there's more than a thousand organizations, primarily here in the United States, but we also are global, so they're all over the world. You can go in and you can search by uh, city, state, and country, or your zip code, and you can pull up organizations that are in your area. So if you say, hey, I really want to get involved, right? You can do a zip code search, and it'll also tell you, are they involved in sex trafficking? Are they in involved with forced labor, child labor, etc. So whatever your interests are, you can do something. Um, so that's one great tool there. There's also something called the directory, excuse me, uh, the action library. And these are tangible actions that you can take today. So I think right now we have over 60 on there. You can go in and you can take every single one of them. And each one of those actions will have profound impact on ending slavery. So it's not things just like donate money or learn or, or pray even. Um, they're very tangible things that you can do, requests that have been made to us. Um, so you can go on and look at that. We also have um, job opportunities. Um, so once a month we curate and collect all of the different professional job opportunities for folks. That's a huge resource that people really love. Um, and so there's just a lot on there. Another major one is our slave free buying guide. So if you sign up for our email list, um, which we send out three new ideas or three new ways to get involved each Friday. Um, if you sign up for that, you'll get a copy of our Slave Free Buying Guide. And our Slave Free Buying Guide, um, the second question that I often get, right, the first is, oh my gosh, what can I do? Uh, and the second one is, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I was buying all of these products. What can I buy? Um, and we found, once again, that's really hard to identify. What can you actually buy? Um, and so our team has gone through and, and read through and, and become really familiar with all of the different certification processes. Um, so as you can imagine, right, organic, right, there's this huge certification process. So similar, similarly, for slave-free products, there's a huge certification process, but there's more than a dozen of them. Um, and so us as consumers, how do you know which one you can buy? So we've gone through, we've done the research, we've presented it very clearly so that you know, hey, if it has Rainforest Alliance on it, you can buy it. That also means that it didn't use slaves. If it has fair trade on it, it also means you can do it. If it has, right, and there's, there's dozens of them. Um, and then we also make product recommendations so that if you want to go eat a chocolate bar um, and you're not interested in buying something super local and super artisan, which is often a lot of the alternatives, uh, we tell you what you can get. And so that's a great resource and we keep adding to it. Um, and it'll tell you what you can buy and feel confident that you're not using slave labor. I do truly believe um, it, it was so much easier in, in the abolitionist era, you had to convince people that slavery is wrong, right? I no longer have to convince people that it's wrong. It is, however, very difficult to convince them that they're responsible for it because there's this divorce between the idea that um, I don't see who's making my products, therefore I don't comprehend that it, right, I'm doing something wrong. And making that connection is really challenging, um, and I just hope that people understand that this can really be eradicated. The reason that people continue to enslave others and continue to traffic others is because there's a market for it. I want cheap goods, whether I'm buying them from a local superstore or I'm buying them from my market down the street. I want the cheapest option. Um, and I don't connect that with what that means down the road. And so uh, traffickers and enslavers will always have a job um, until I'm no longer willing to 
to buy their product, right? Um, and so I really firmly believe that it's on us um, if we actually want to end it. And so I think that there's lots of opportunity and I hope that people start taking a look at how they can play a role because we all have to if we're actually gonna to eradicate this, not just abolish it legally, um, but to eradicate it truly, the practice of it.